Praise the Lord. We will read Psalm 139, 15 to 24. And it says, Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. And in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. Surely thou wilt slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, ye bloody men, for they speak against thee wickedly, and thine enemies take thy name in vain. Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? <coughs> Pardon me. And am I am and am not I grieved with those that rise up against thee? I hate them with perfect hatred, I count them mine enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Again, read in verse number 16, it says, Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. And in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. The idea is quite plain. The Lord had drawn us, had us drawn, had us drawn out in his mind before we were even formed or created. That is, we, like the Word of God, were written in God's book, or should we say, his mind knew all about our members, bodily members, and our bodily functions, and each of our characteristics, we can say, they were there with God who actually put all of them together in his mind before they were created. Well, maybe he had some angels written had, that had written them down. And then we were concepted and born. And then what was written in the books, maybe, were there present for the angels to compare and see that it was true. He had everything planned out. Now that would be amazing. Alleluia. From the psalmist, it is expressed that God visualized exactly what we were before we were formed in the womb of our mothers, being, as it states, unperfect. However, it does say, and in thy book all my members were written. So that means, well, in thy book. So does that mean that it's a heavenly book and that the angels are writing down in certain heavenly books about us and about our members? It very well could be. No doubt, because it does say in thy book, amen. So he does, that shows a concern of God for people, for his people, for the people that are coming into this world. He had it all planned out beforehand. So, and question is, how was it that it was written in his book? It states, I suppose this could be literal or figurative, but it sounds pretty literal. And being literally, it would be a book in heaven. The characteristics were written down of all of my members, meaning that, yes, the psalmist members, but also uh, people, more than just the psalmist, obviously. And they were written down, too, because before they even existed materially. 
What did exist, though, was in the mind of God, exactly as he would make people in the womb. But it seems like he transferred, transferred that mindset, what he had about people, about his people, uh, into a book. And since it says a book, like um, the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Okay, so in the beginning, he had it in his mind. But then it was transferred into a book, and that was actually written by people, that is, people on earth. But when it talks about how we were written in a book, in, in thy book, all my members were written. That sounds like... Um, it would have to be uh, some book in heaven. Hallelujah. And before, because here it says, when as yet there was none of them. When as yet there was none of them. So the members, that is my members, were written down. Obviously, they couldn't, be, couldn't have been written by a man, a human being. Um. And because the human beings would not know, uh, of course, they could be inspired by God, but nothing of that is uh, found as far as we know. So it had to be a, so it has to be a, a book up in heaven. And that means that there are many, 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 many books. Wow. The number of books in heaven about people. And... When as yet I was not made, that is the psalmist and those people, everybody, a book was written about our members. Very interesting, to say the least. So, uh, that is how he would make uh, whoever was concepted and then born into this life he would have it written in a book. That means, and I think, when as yet there was none of them, none of our members yet formed in the womb, it was already written down what members we had, what maybe our characteristics and, and so on and so forth. This, said, this, show, this shows the concern and love of the Creator toward mankind shows that he is delightly, delightfully interested in us. It shows that God has an overwhelming desire to be in fellowship with us. He wants us to regard, honor, worship, and love him. But he has already shown his love and concern and care and even writing down in a book before we were even formed. So much care and love for his people, for his, for people. He wishes our worship to be for him and him alone because of all the things that he has done for us. That, <clears throat> according to the psalmist here, is a fact, and it is the inspired word of God. And I believe it. Verse number 17 says, now listen to this too. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God! How great is the sum of them! Here it shows that God had and has great and wonderful thoughts concerning us. These thoughts, the psalmist acknowledges, are great and precious. They are thoughts that are so precious and great, and the psalmist acknowledges how great the sum of them are. That means that God thinks of us so much more than we think of him, obviously. Mm -hmm. His thoughts towards us are beyond what we could ever even imagine. Verse number 18 says, If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. Now listen to this when he talks about the comparison of his thoughts and the sand even though his thoughts are not sand, but he's comparing it. Here, the psalmist acknowledges that God's thoughts in number are more than the sand. 
and I did write it first, of the seashore. But there's more sand than just the sea, seashore sand. There's even deserts in the world that have sand. There's dunes. The sand, if you combine all the sand in the entire world, how much sand, if you were to count each grain of sand, this it says they are more in number than the sand. The sand, I believe, refers to the totality of the grain of sands in all of the entire earth that God's thoughts are more in number than each grain of sand that there are in the entire world towards one person individually. That is an amazing fact. That is an amazing a conception about how much God thinks of us. You know, the more you think about a person, it's kind of like you begin to really love that person. There, Usually you have your thoughts towards your wife or your husband or your girlfriend or boyfriend, and then you love them. You think about them. You kind of, you're, you're daily in thinking about that person that you love. Well, God is love. The Bible says God is love, and he has a great love for us. So then he thinks about us so much more than we ever think of him. He is love then. You could compare that to his love. His love is so extreme compared to our love towards him. Amen. And that was kind of like uh, um, when we talked about the Apostle Paul, and he had uh, shown a lot of love and care for the Corinthians, and he wanted that in return. And so here we have the example of God loving his people, and his thoughts are so great, so many towards us, comparable to the entire grain grains of sand that fill the entire earth. More, he has more thoughts about us than the entire grains of sand in the entire world. And he thinks about us more than that individually. So that just shows us what kind of God he is. He's, he's an amazing God. Absolutely amazing. How he can think so much about us. And he probably did that before we were even born or concepted. He had already thought more about us than we than when we were concepted. In other words, he thought more about the um, he had more thoughts than the entire grains of sand in the entire world about us before we were even concepted. That's probably the case because his love is so great. So here the psalmist acknowledges that God's thoughts and number are more than the sand of the seashore. But the psalmist does not state the sand of one seashore, even just the sand of the seashore. For there is sand that is even in the desert, which is the largest, which the largest of the deserts is the Sahara Desert. And you can imagine how, how many grains of sand there are there. And the psalmist only mentioned sand, and more specifically, the sand. That means that all of the sand of the earth, including all the sand on every seashore, of every desert, of every dune, of every place where sand is found on earth, and tell it up, and only God, I suppose, could do so. But his thoughts towards us is more than all of the sand of the entire earth. Even if one takes it considering individual people, God's thoughts are more numerous for every one of his people than the sand on the entire earth individually. What does that mean concerning God? His power, his delight, his desire towards us, his love. It shows that we are totally in his plan. 
His power, his wishes, he has made it possible for us. Though God is invisible that and no one has seen God at any time, except in the human form of Jesus Christ, he wants us to become his sons and daughters. We are the sons of God. We are the chosen ones and the ones that will inherit what he has provided to us. Amen. Verse number 19 says, Surely thou wilt slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, ye bloody men. Here the psalmist speaks of what God will do with the wicked. Everyone will face a physical death unless God comes and calls his people home to be with him. Then the idea is, what is this that it says God will slay the wicked? It sounds, it does sound like the children of Israel entering the promised land, coming upon the people living there and killing them, even their smallest children. It also sounds like God sending the flood upon the antediluvian world, killing all but those within the ark except the fish. Thus the flood caused all the land animals and birds and human beings and giants to be exterminated because God had slain the ones outside the ark. Verse 20 says, For they speak wickedly, for they speak against thee wickedly, and thine enemies take thy name in vain. Here is what the psalmist wrote about the wicked and some of their actions. They speak against God. taking his name in vain. Thus it appears here that the name of the Lord is taken in vain by speech that the wicked might so commonly do. One thing that God has done is provided salvation and has done so through the gift of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And on the day of Pentecost, it was on that day that the Spirit of God was poured out and in doing so, it meant that the ones that had received the gift of the Holy Ghost began speaking in other tongues as the Spirit of God had given them the utterance. Thus, the experience of receiving God's Spirit made a change in the lives of those who had received it. And also, the tongue was used by God to speak in a different language that the speaker did not know. Therefore, the fire of God went into the speakers, and the fire of God no doubt had changed their tongues to speak what God wanted them to speak instead of things, of course, that were against God. They were for God. Verse 21 says, Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee, and am I not grieved with those that rise up against thee? The ones who serve God are thrilled with anyone who will serve God wholeheartedly. For those who hate the Lord, they have the ones who serve God <clears throat> grieve over them. There's a grieving process by those who serve God and those who don't. Their hatred is shown in writing by the psalmist as being an action from the wicked to rise up against God. How can people rise up against God since he's invisible and cannot be seen? How is it that people could ever rise up against God? It could be that people rise up against those whom God has sent. For example, it was Korah who had risen up against Moses and was challenging his leadership, but that leadership was given to Moses by God. Therefore, God was the one who responded to Korah and the others about it. It could be stated then that Korah had risen up against God. In the New Testament, we have the story of Ananias and Sapphira who had willingly wished to give the monies that they had sold to the Lord. That is, they uh, sold their land, and they were going to give their monies, the complete entire um, amount that they sold the land for, and give it to the church. But it says that they kept back of the, the price, kept back part of the price. <clears throat> But they didn't tell anyone. And they came and dropped a particular amount of money, but it was not the amount that they had sold it for. And so the Holy Spirit, no doubt, was dealing with them about their thoughts because uh, they had spoken together as husband and wife about their plan. And of course, the Holy Spirit was the one who knew about it, but possibly nobody else knew about it. 
so they thought they could easily just um well there were the the, the person who bought it knew about it and possibly he told other people but the holy spirit knew about it and they went to church and probably the church people did not know about it at all apostle peter probably didn't know anything either about how much exactly they had sold their land for however the holy spirit did and so that came up when they brought the price that they said that they sold it for but it was not the real price then came the judgment of god upon the man ananias first and then later his wife so no doubt the holy spirit was dealing with them as they ha still held back the part of the price and the judgment of god came upon them and they both died for it that might have just happened because god wanted his people to know that the judgment from God still exists, even though that we have the Spirit of God. Even though we've been born again, we have God living in us, still judgment can come upon us for doing things that are evil. And this one brought them to the point of death. The idea of once saved, always saved doesn't seem to coincide with Ananias and Sapphira's death. It is instead like a warning to speak the truth also. And uh, what one says one will do as a child of God. In other words, this was kind of like a, a vow. This is what I'm going to do. And then they uh, did not bring that amount that they had said that they would bring. And so it was like they had vowed to give all the monies of the sale of that land and give it to the Lord. But they tried to trick the apostles and the church, I guess, <clears throat> and the Holy Spirit. But in the end, it did not end well, for they died. And uh, the Holy Spirit spoke through Peter, and uh, their trick was discovered. And so they both died. The psalmist expressed his feeling of hatred towards those who hated the Lord. Today, in the New Testament, we would love all, but we would not love the actions that are sinful. As Jesus even emphasized to love one, one's enemies, we should love our enemies. That's what he taught. Why would it be that some are called our enemies? Well, it is because they must do certain things against us that any normal person would hate or other actions that are not God's will, possibly. Certainly, God loves all people but hates the sins that they do. And that does not mean that God condones their actions just because he loves them. Verse 22 says, I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them mine enemies. In the Old Testament, the people of Israel were taught to hate. That, According to this text, um, they were to have a perfect hatred towards those that hated the Lord. One wonders why in the Old Test in the New Testament this radically changes by what Jesus had said to love one one's enemies. Today countries fight over land and over ideologies, but the ideologies part is more prevalent. And the idea is to spread the ide ideology further around the world so that in essence it will do away with the other ideologies. For the Israelite it meant that the God of the Israelites were who they had worshipped, and anyone who hated Israel actually hated God, the God, the God that they served. Then the psalmist himself had stated, which the Israelites had learned, to hate the enemies of Israel and those that hate God, or the hate that hate God, they they would hate them too. Uh, thus, hatred was taught when people began reading about the word of God in the Old Testament. The country of Israel was the example to serve God and only God and no one else. But those who served other gods were the ones most likely to hate the God of the Israelites. In the New Testament, we come to a total reverse of this. In Matthew chapter 5, 43 to 48. You have heard that it had, hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. When he says... You have heard that it has been said. It's talking about the Old Testament. 
Verse 44, but I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Ye. Do not even the publicans the same, and if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so. Be therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. The idea that many have is to retaliate, retaliate against those who have done them wrong. The only reason, really, why people hate others is because of something that they have done against them, or for their belief system, or the God that they worship. But Jesus pointed out that his people were to love others, even a person's enemy. Thus, for the Christian, our motto should be, love your enemies, just as Jesus had stated. Jesus is giving thus the reward to those to love those that do not love us, and that was named as perfection. Um, that's very difficult, too. <laughs> Verse number 23 and 24 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. When the Christian learns about the fact that he or she should love one's neighbor, and then, and then reads these verses, 23 and 24, it follows that the person may be asking God to look at his thoughts, ways, and heart to see if the Christian has any hatred against the person who might be entitled his or her enemy and have God change one's perceptive on how to treat that person. That would be in the idea of the New Testament. For the disciples of Jesus, they learned from the Master. There were times that they had heard truthfully that Jesus knew the thoughts of those who had doubtful thoughts in their mind about what he was doing or just unbelief. <clears throat> what the psalmist was expressing here is the idea of God looking at the psalmist's thought to see if there were any kind of wicked ways in him so as to change them for the better, lead him towards the way, towards everlasting life. He was also asking God to try him and know his heart. Sometimes it's difficult to be tried. and He seems to come across as though, try me. Well, I don't know if I would actually like to say that. Within our lives, there is a place where we can keep, as it is our decision, our thoughts, yet they are not fully unknown, for God knows everything about our thoughts, even before we think them. And what will happen is we continually think these thoughts, whether they are good or bad. The psalmist here has a petition before God. Now, this one I like. He desired to be led by God towards the way that leads to life everlasting. That is a wonderful petition before God. It was such a great petition that it was inspired by God to the psalmist to write it. And one that God would desire for his followers to also have that same petition. Petition could be classified the most important or the priority petition is seemingly here. Why is it such an important petition? The reason is because it concerned him finding or staying on the pathway towards life everlasting. That is a petition that should be embedded in our petition folder. Do you have a petition folder? Well, I don't, but. You know, it sounded good. And one that should come up very often. In fact, that petition is a petition that needs to be repeated often in our request for prayer. So we read the Bible. We read Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24, 24. And that petition comes up again and again. Maybe I should memorize it. And it can be stated with assurance that the psalmist wished that petition be known by others for them to pray for his own way to be illuminated on the pathway of life. 
But today also we continue to pray that others would be added onto that pathway of life. He mentioned that he wanted to be on the path of light and life, and God direct him to be on the path of light of life. Today we also add others. God help them to get on the pathway to life. First, though, we should be on that pathway to life, so we should be praying for God to help us on the roadway to life. But many times people skip that petition because they think that they're already on the pathway to life. But yet we still should continue to pray that petition. Uh, mm -hmm. Lead me in the way everlasting. Get on that road. Keep me on that road. Or if I'm not on the right road, please get me on the right road. God, I pray in Jesus' name. And then uh, other people, please add other people to the roadway to life. So first, though, we should be on the pathway to life, so we should be praying for God to help us on the roadway to life. Then, of course, when we are on the pathway, we can lead others to get on the same pathway that leads to life everlasting. It is one that is really necessary to be praying for, for ourselves to be on the path that pathway and for others to join with us. The petitions that are for healings of our bodies could be secondary, but they are also important. Lastly, the petitions that are for having God bless us with some monetary rewards or some other benefits that are temporary, such as houses or cars, mobile phones or computers, would probably be classified after all the spiritual ones that seem to be more important. For these things will only last temporarily, but those things that last on into eternity those are the things that are definitely on the priority list. Glory to God. And may God bless you today in Jesus' name.